In the opening scene, we are introduced to Isabel, a young, fun-loving girl about to fly to a different city for work. A co-passenger sees her struggle to place her bags in the overhead compartment and offers to help. This starts a conversation between the two, and soon, the chit-chat leads them to talk about their professions. We find out that the man is a classical music critic. In other words, he makes fun of dead people. What an important job. Isabel tries to keep the conversation going and reveals that her first boyfriend was also a classical musician named Pasternak. The name rings a bell in the man's head, and he remembers the worst musical theory he was given to review many years back. The person who submitted the theory was also named Pasternak. The man recalls how he dragged the theory to the ground with his review and ended Pasternak's musical career. That's fine, he later became a great hockey player. Suddenly, Isabel looks at him in surprise, revealing that they are talking about the same person. She was still Pasternak's girlfriend when the review for his music theory came out, and she remembers how he didn't come out of his room for three days after the review was published. Just then, an old woman in another row gets intrigued by their conversation. She turns around and discloses that Pasternak was her student years ago in high school. He is still the most unique student she has had because... <laughs> He wasn't good at anything. The three look at each other in surprise at the coincidence, but the strange occurrences don't end there. A young man from a few rows in front recognizes the old woman as his high school teacher. As it turns out, he used to bully Pasternak in school. The musical critic recognizes the pattern and asks the other passengers if any of them knows someone named Pasternak. When almost all of them raise their hands, it is clear that something is wrong. I'll tell you what's wrong. Pasternak is missing his surprise party. This is further proven when they find out no one on the plane even paid for their tickets. Some of them won it in a lottery, and others were sent by their companies like Isabel was. The music critic asks Isabel how her relationship with Pasternak ended, and she discloses that she cheated on him with his only friend, who is also seated a few seats back on the plane. They conclude that every passenger on the plane has done something bad to Pasternak, and he has set them up to fly together all at once. As everyone begins panicking, a scared flight attendant comes out and reveals that she was forced to work to Day by Pasternak, who is the cabin chief of the flight. She is worried because a few minutes ago, the pilots stopped responding and the door to the cockpit is closed. Somewhere else, an old couple is enjoying the weekend by the pool, in silence. Their quality time is interrupted by the faint noise of a flying airplane. They do not think much of it, until they notice the plane coming towards them. The story ends seconds before they are hit, leaving the viewers to assume the rest. Those old people must have fucked with Pasternak. The second story in the series takes place in a small diner. One stormy night, a politician named Juan arrives at the empty diner, and the only server, Moza, welcomes him. Right off the bat, Juan is rude and sarcastic towards her. He makes comments about her lack of skills before making his order. Moza stomps to the kitchen, telling the owner of the restaurant that she hates that man. However, it is not for the reason the owner assumes. It turns out that Juan used to be a debt collector in Moza's village a few years ago. He fooled her father into getting into a huge debt, which eventually got him killed. Not even two weeks after the death, he tried to seduce her mother, offering her a lot of money. Because of Juan, Moza and her mother had to move out of the village and start a new life in the city. When Moza comments that she wants to tell Juan off, the owner Alexis suggests her a better option. She wants to poison his food and kill him. Moza, shocked at her boss's reaction, asks her if she is being serious. In the following scene, she goes to Juan to see if he needs anything. He makes an unconventional request and asks her to review his election poster. This is when Moza finds out that the man is running for the mayor of the town. Alexis thinks this is all the more reason to kill him, because they would be doing the city a favor. In addition, she has been to jail before, and knows that it is far better than her life owning a diner. Still, Moza refuses to kill anyone, and goes to Juan with his food. Returning into the kitchen, she finds out that Alexis poisoned it without her consent. The two look at Juan, enjoying the meal in anticipation, but the poison doesn't seem to affect him. Alexis thinks it is because the poison expires, but wonders if expired poison is more or less dangerous. Next, we see Juan's son join him at the table for dinner. Moza panics because she doesn't want to kill an innocent man. She rushes outside and throws the food at Juan, but it is too late because his son has already had some of it. Juan burns in anger and attacks Moza, ready to kill her. But before he does so, Alexis thinks on her feet and brutally stabs him to death. The customer is always wrong, bitch. Moza gets up from the floor covered in the blood of her enemy, who is now 
dead. In the last scene, she and Juan's son are being helped by the paramedics, while Alexis is arrested by the police. She doesn't show any signs of remorse and is happy to go to prison. Still better than a politician, though. At least she didn't say she wasn't going to poison him before she poisoned him. The third story takes place on a deserted highway. A wealthy, stuck-up businessman named Diego is driving on his own when he encounters another car swerving past him. Enraged by the driver's lack of driving skills, Diego yells racial slurs at him and gives him the finger. Only a few miles away, he gets a flat tire and has to stop his car right in front of a bridge. He tries his best to fix the tire, but for some reason, the car doesn't start. Giving up, Diego calls a mechanic who will be there in half an hour. Right after the call, he notices the car from earlier driving towards him. Knowing that the driver would want revenge, Diego quickly gets inside and locks the doors. As he had predicted, the driver, named Milan, parks his car in front and backs into Diego's car. He goes on to bring out a hammer and smash it several times into the windshield. Diego watches him in frustration, trying to control his anger because he knows he can't do anything. In turn, Milan takes his abuse further by defecating on the car's windshield and peeing on it. After that, he gets into his car and suddenly, Diego's car starts working. Who can pee at that game with burning rage in his eyes? He drives his car into Milan's and pushes it off a cliff before driving away. In the following scene, we see Milan climbing up the cliff. Having survived the crash, he runs after Diego but cannot keep up with the car. Just when we think their interaction has ended, something takes over Diego and he makes a U-turn, aiming to drive into Milan and kill him. However, before he can, he loses control of his car and falls down the cliff like Milan did. The latter now has an upper hand. He breaks into Diego's vehicle with a crowbar and gets into a fight with him. They struggle for a long time before Milan manages to push Diego off the car with the seatbelt wrapped around his neck. He then sets fire to the gas tank, hoping the car will explode and take Diego with it. But before he can get off, the businessman gains control of his position and holds him back. Back on the bridge, a mechanic arrives and witnesses a loud explosion before hurriedly calling the police. In the last scene, the police are examining the burnt car. The dead bodies are together, which they assume is because they were trying to save each other. The moral of that tale is that roadside assistance takes too long to get there. The fourth short film is about an engineer named Simon. One day after work, he goes to a bakery, excited to buy a cake for his daughter's birthday. On his way out, Simon notices his car is missing and finds a parking ticket on the ground. It turns out that he parked in a restricted zone, which he could have never known because the curb isn't painted yellow. Even though he is getting late for the birthday party, he decides to go to the DMV office first to file a complaint. To his utter disbelief, he is asked to pay the parking and the towing fee before he can make a complaint about the unpainted curb. He tries to argue his way with the officer, but is dismissed. On his way home, Simon is stopped by a traffic jam, so his daughter has to cut a cookie on her birthday instead of the cake. Simon's wife, Melissa, is enraged by his negligence to his family. Even when she is explaining her disappointment, Simon keeps complaining about the lack of regulations in their city. In the end, Melissa asks for a divorce, deciding she can no longer be with him. The following day, Simon visits the DMV office yet again and is faced with the same problem. No one wants to take his complaint before he pays for the mistake he didn't make. All his pent-up frustration comes out as he hits the glass barrier with a fire extinguisher. He is arrested immediately, and the news makes it to television. The following day, Simon's lawyer bails him out and reveals that he has been kicked out by his company for ruining their image. The same day, he has to be at the court to discuss who gets custody of his daughter after the divorce. The case leans towards his wife because he has no job at the moment. To solve this, Simon immediately starts looking for work, but because of his reputation, no company wants to give him a chance. Frustrated by the rejection, he curses out the receptionist at one of the offices, but karma catches up with him quickly when he finds out his car has been towed again. This time, he simply takes a cab to the DMV office, pays off the ticket, and brings his car back. In the next scene, we see Simon enjoying breakfast at a cafe. His car is parked outside, again in a no-parking zone, but this time, even the curb is marked. He watches in silence as his car is towed away for the third time in two weeks. Hours later, a loud explosion startles everyone in the DMV office and breaks down half of the building. It turns out that Simon, being an engineer, fitted his car with dynamite to teach the DMV office a lesson. His lawyer fights the case in court, claiming that the explosion was accidental. This gains media attention and several cases of DMV treating people unfairly come out in the news. At last, Simon gets his revenge and revenge for the thousands of people who are treated indifferently by the DMV on a daily basis. In the last scene, we see him celebrating his birthday in prison with his daughter and wife. He is now an icon for the public who lovingly call him 
dynamite. The moral of that one is, if you got a problem with the government, just skip straight to the killing. The fifth story starts at the break of dawn, when a young man named Santiago drives home from a club. He goes straight to his parents' room and wakes them up in a hurry. A few hours later, they are watching the news on the television about a hit-and-run case. It is revealed that Santiago accidentally hit a pregnant woman with his car and killed both the mother and her unborn baby. These are getting darker as they go, aren't they? Santiago's father, Romino, is a wealthy businessman, willing to do anything to save his son from going to jail. The family of three panics and calls their lawyer, telling him everything that has happened, and the man promises to get them out of the situation. They are well aware that the police will find the car sooner or later. Hence, there is no benefit in staying quiet. The lawyer is brainstorming ideas, when suddenly, his eyes land on the housekeeper, Jose, working outside in the garden. In the next scene, Romino and Jose are sitting in front of each other in his study room. A worried Romino tells Jose everything about the accident, and offers him half a million dollars to take the blame for his son. If Jose accepts the offer, the lawyer swears he will get out of prison in less than a year. In addition, his family will not have to worry about money a day in their life. Jose accepts the offer without thinking about it twice. Next, the lawyer takes him to the wrecked car and makes him leave his fingerprints all over the steering wheel. He is also asked to drink a bit of whiskey to make the story seem legitimate. The police arrive right after, and the lawyer tells them the made-up story. Jose also admits to the crime, but the sheriff insists on looking at a few more pieces of evidence before arresting him. He asks Jose to get inside the wrecked car, and instantly notices the mirrors are arranged in such a way that he cannot see through them. This means that someone way taller than Jose was driving the car. Seeing that the truth is about to come out, the lawyer bribes the sheriff and brings him to their side. Romino is told that he will have to pay them a few million bucks to get out of the situation. Even Jose demands for an expensive apartment, annoying his boss. The four men gather in Romino's study room to talk about their cuts. They try to take advantage of the situation he is in, demanding an absurd amount for different reasons. Suddenly, Romino loses interest in the matter and tells everyone to get out. He is ready to let his son go to jail then to fulfill their demands. The others think he is just bluffing, but when he goes into his room and locks the door, it is clear that he wants to end the deal. A few hours later, a crowd is gathered outside the house, having discovered where the killer lives. Romino's wife tries to convince him otherwise, but the man remains adamant. Then, the lawyer comes to him with another deal, demanding only $3 million for each of them. Romino, as a true businessman, brings the money down to $1 million and finalizes the deal. At last, Jose is arrested and brought out of the house in a hood. Suddenly, a man jumps out of the crowd and attacks him, hitting him until he dies. We find out that the man is none other than the husband of the woman who died in the accident. That story had no moral. That story was stupid. Now, for the final story. It takes place at a wedding. Romina and Dominic are getting married after years of relationship, and the party is bussin'. The guests have the time of their lives, singing, dancing, and enjoying delicious food. When everything is going well, suddenly, Romina notices her husband talking to a female co-worker. They seem to be flirting, which makes Romina feel uncomfortable. She quickly calls a number on her phone and watches the woman as she picks it up. Romina freezes as she realizes that Dominic has been cheating on her with his co-worker. She she knows this because the number she called belongs to Dominic's alleged guitar instructor, who he visited frequently last month. All Dominic knew how to play was Wonderwall. It was a dead giveaway. Before she can react, the DJ initiates the start of the bride and groom's first dance. Romina takes this opportunity to ask Dominic if what she thinks is true. At first, he begs her to just enjoy the party and not think about unnecessary stuff. But after she pushes him repeatedly, he admits to sleeping with the woman. He promises that he will never do anything like that again. But Romina is too angry to listen to his excuses. She bolts out of the venue and ends up on the roof of the building. A while later, she is approached by a chef who sympathizes with her. Romina sees this as an opportunity to take revenge and starts making out with him. Boner appetite. When Dominic arrives, he sees his wife and the chef making love. Romina shows no regret and instead threatens Dominic that she will take all his property and leave him with nothing. Dominic falls to the ground vomiting, giving her an opportunity to go back to the party. She acts like nothing happened in front of the guests and asks them to enjoy themselves. The party is filled with laughter and dances once again. A while later, Dominic arrives and is pulled onto the dance floor. Before he knows it, Romina is pulling his mistress to dance with her. She goes absolutely manic and throws the woman into a glass door in the middle of the dance. In the next scene, the paramedics are on the scene, taking care of the women. Romina still acts like nothing is wrong and hurries her friends to start the wedding games they had planned. Dominic finally loses his cool 
and yells at her in front of the guests. His mother takes it further and attacks the bride before being pulled away. The doctors sit everyone down to measure their blood pressure, trying to calm the situation. Just when the guests think the chaos has ended, Dominic gets up and holds a knife. He surprises everyone by cutting the wedding cake and taking a huge bite of it. Shit, Dominic, I thought you were watching your calories. At last, he walks up to his bride, spreading his arms for a wedding dance. To everyone's surprise, they start making out on the middle of the dance floor. When things start getting steamy, they leave the venue quickly, leaving the newlyweds by themselves. The movie ends as the two make love on